Hi and welcome back everybody to another reaction video where we try to learn something new and to promote history on YouTube. So today we're going to react to the video called Germany could not win World War II part 2 from the channel Potential History. As always I'm going to give my thoughts and opinions and additional information that I know uh, and also as always the link to the original video is in the description below so give them a view and a like. Uh, so yeah we did it we reached 500 subscribers yay uh, and uh, I wish you all a warm welcome for the ones that are new to the channel I hope that you're gonna come see new videos when they come come out and uh, I hope that you're also going to comment in the comment section below to give your thoughts and opinions on the different topics as you are doing uh, now in the last videos so okay uh, let's just jump into the topic and also additional information uh, there's a patreon link if you want to support the the, the channel and if you want to support uh, future projects the patron members uh, decided for the next project and it's going to be subjectivity and objectivity in history and uh, yeah, if you want to take part in future projects or just support the channel financially, you can do it via Patreon and you can also uh, suggest other videos in the comment section below which you want me to react to. So let's just jump into the video. Is it? Yeah, Medal of Honor. Excellent work with the German Miss, pal. Here's to hoping better sources will be used in the future. However, our intel has picked up reports of continued resistance in the Comet sections. Mentions of Dunkirk and who not to invade seem widespread. We will be dropping you directly into the Comet section with your primary objective being to root out these myths. Be cautious though. Reports indicate that the Wereboos will be armed with Cold War era memoirs and David Irving books. Godspeed, <laughs> Lieutenant. Yeah, the comment section. That was actually a cool intro. This video is brought... And just to say, I'm so proud of you guys that the comment section at this channel is normal and that the people discuss mostly the topics that are involved or in the videos. ...to you by Dashlane. Stay secure online and never forget a password again. More on that later. So you may recall around six months ago, I made a video about how due to Germany's lacking in the population, industrial, and raw material sectors, they could not have pulled out a victory in the war they started in 1939. And it sort of got out of hand. I think we should read the comments. The other day, as I was reading the comment section there, I found that, along with some people agreeing with me, there were a lot of dissenting opinions of yet more ways that people thought the final victory could be achieved. And I am here today to respond to them, and also probably clear up what I meant at the end of the last video, talking about limited use of alternative history. Here are a few more ways Germany could not have won World War II. Okay, so he's probably going to uh, use this, the, the same method, like he's going to present uh, one uh, topic and then move, explain it and then move to the next one. Kill the British at Dunkirk. Okay, so the famous Dunkirk. One thing I have seen brought up a few times is that if Hitler had not let the British Expeditionary Force get away at Dunkirk, that later the troops could not be used during Operation Overlord and thus no Western Front, with the implication that the German troops could have been sent east to stop the Soviets. This however has two problems. Firstly, the BEF was not simply allowed to leave France as this narrative suggests. In Mein Kampf, Hitler does speak yep. highly of the British at times and suggests that they could be a potential ally, but this is clearly without a strong grasp of British culture and political policy and was always discussed with Germany being above Britain and having them be administrators of the Reich, but only if they could shake their quote, Jewish influence. Furthermore, he realized that Britain was against his intentions in the East and would become a barrier there. All this being said, by the time of the invasion of France, Britain was definitely an enemy and Hitler was doing them no favors. So then why yeah. Dunkirk? Well, this was an operational failing, not a peaceful gesture. Yeah, just uh, an interesting thing to that. Yeah, Hitler thought 
like of course the german race is the most superior like those were his thoughts the german ra race was the most superior but then you had the french and the british who are also like culturally let's let's say valuable or that are almost at the at the same level and that's why you don't see a lot of destruction there there was destruction but not like in eastern europe but you saw little or less destruction in france belgium the netherlands like in the western uh, 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 states then in in the eastern states like poland uh, the czech republic russia ukraine belarus and so on so yeah he thought that actually the british and the french were more like more more or near to nearer to be superior to germans than the slavic people so then why dunkirk well this was an operational failing not a peaceful gesture on May 15th, 1940, the Germans broke through the French 2nd and 9th armies and steamed ahead night and day, thanks in part to some tablet boys, yep. towards the coast. Although these gains yeah, were good were for dropped. the Germans, the mechanized forces were quickly running out of supplies and were leaving their flanks exposed, which opened them to being cut off, the result of which could cause ruin for the German plans. It is at this point a nervous Hitler, being counseled by Generals von Kluge and von Rundstedt, gave a halt order to secure the flanks and allow the exhausted panzer divisions to refit. Check out this video by Mark Gerges for more. Upon the halt, our favorite drug-addled flyboy Goering promised the Luftwaffe could destroy the British at Dunkirk, and although he failed, I would hardly call the actions of the Luftwaffe just letting the British go. With thousands being killed, over yeah. 200 ships being sunk, over 100 planes shot down, and the loss of all the BEF's equipment, Hitler even realized that the halt was an error and resumed the attack while the evacuation was underway, and it was only successful due to the brave French soldiers that held out until it was complete. But even if he had let yep. them go, there are still <laughs> more problems Dabby. asserting that this means a German victory in the war. Britain had to rearm all the soldiers evacuated, which is a huge loss and took some time. This force when returned to England was not in any way ready to turn around and invade France, although the troop reserves were good to have if Germany decided to invade. But they were not in fighting condition for a long time. But most importantly, Britain is not the only nation present at D-Day. A combined yeah. landing force of American, Canadians. British, and Canadian forces, yep. along with smaller groups from other countries, landed and fought on the Western Front. Although the troop loss, if Dunkirk had failed, may have limited Britain's number of troops, the United States having only mobilized about 9% of its population in the course of the war, could have very realistically filled in the gaps as it did in reality with the British equipment losses. But all of this still doesn't take into account where the real war is being fought, in the East. The German army will be decidedly on its back foot after Kursk, and the Soviets have massive offensives planned in 1944 regardless of what the Western Allies do. Would the defeat of Germany have taken longer without the Western Front opening? Of course it would. But by 1944, the Soviets have a decisive upper hand and will push the Germans back to Berlin. So to say the war could have been shifted if the British had 300,000 fewer troops ignores the reality of what the Germans were truly up against by 1944. Yeah. Okay, so let's discuss the, 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 the point. So the point is, um, if the Germans just have had eliminated all the troops, the British troops in Dunkirk. So he says, yeah, of, like, like it wasn't, uh, although Hitler, Hitler had a more, let's say, a more positive view about the French, like the Western uh, European nations, he knew that the Brits and the French were enemies, so he uh, it wasn't just like a hey, let's just kill a few of them and let the others retreat. No, they really attacked the British and, and did a lot of damage. And also he pointed out that a lot of the British um, arms needed to be left behind. So Britain was actually damaged very hard like there's also the thing with churchill uh the complicated I, I i don't want to go into it but you can check it out uh and the evacuation that that the british did but yeah the germans actually attacked in a let's call it normal fashion way the british at dunkirk and he makes also the point yeah the the russians gave the germans in uh, a hard time after the Battle of Stalingrad and when the Russians pushed 
to westwards towards Germany. So yeah, the Russians were a definite threat. And also he points out that the Western Front would be open anyway because of the Americans joining the war and that the Americans would could uh, replenish the British troops that perished, uh, that could have perished in Dunkirk. And yeah, the Australians and the Canadians and the British and also like French, smaller French troops that came on, Polish and so on. So yeah, I think that he debunked the that one. Yeah. Do not declare war on insert superpower. This is another one I saw a lot. Just don't invade the Soviet Union, or just don't declare war on the United States. And although these comments are puzzling on the surface, as removing a major combatant redefines what the war is and you are now describing how to win a smaller conflict, there are reasons this doesn't work that are all to do with character motivation and why these things were going to happen unless you fundamentally- Yeah, like, Hitler was known that, that he wanted power and he wanted to expand the German influence, especially in the East. We all know the, the phrase Drang nach Osten and uh, Lebensraum, uh, Untermenschen. Uh, he would attack the Soviet un Union anyway. It was just a matter of time when. And with the French and the British, well, actually they declared war on Germany, so Germany was already in war with them. So they change who the Germans and Hitler were and then strain to fiction. Let's first start with the Soviet Union. If you read Mein Kampf, don't do it, it's not a very good book, or <laughs> listen to a lot of Hitler's speeches, both in public and in private, he fixates on this idea of Judeo-Bolshevism, which yeah, is a rather yeah. outdated term that grew out of the idea of a Jewish conspiracy that had created communism, and the two were the biggest evils facing the Aryan nation. There's a whole rabbit hole to go down here with multiple theorists <laughs> and their ideas, but I'm not going to go into it here. But that's the basic idea, and Hitler subscribed to it. And the result of this is Hitler's main goal being to destroy the Soviet Union and become the savior of the Aryan people in his eyes. And in the process, wiping out millions of subhuman Slavs and resettle the land with Germans. Yeah. Hitler saw this as his destiny, meaning he was going to do it at some point, and that this fictitious Hitler that would win World War II by not invading the East is just that, fiction. He ceases becoming the Hitler that we know and that existed, and yeah. now we're talking about a made-up story. Now, as to why the Soviet Union was invaded when it was comes down to two things. Resources and, frankly, paranoia. Germany, as I outlined in my previous video on this, spent a lot of the war with fairly limited oil resources and knew that it couldn't support this attack any later than June of 41 with all the fuel that the battle over Britain was consuming. And even the trade with the Soviet Union would not make up for this deficit. So the High Command felt they had to go in when they did before the army would not be able to move as they needed to finish the campaign by September. The time in which the High Command figured the Soviet Union would collapse in on itself under the weight of the German attack. And I'll point you to David Stahill again for more information on that. Yeah, as he discussed in, in the previous video, so in part one, like Germany was dependent on oil and that's one of the main re reasons why they attacked the Soviet Union because of the rich oil field uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, so, but yeah, um, they eventually didn't uh, pull all the resources towards uh, the Caucasus, but they... Uh, diverged the army to attack Leningrad and Moscow and Stalingrad and so on. But yeah, as I said, like they would attack the Soviet Union just because of the ideology. If the econom uh, ec economic or war tactic, whatever, they would attack the Soviet Union just because of the ideology and the uh, anti-Semitism. That. The other aspect was, as I said, paranoia. I've often seen this assertion stated in a different way of don't break the alliance with the Soviet Union, although I wouldn't even frame the German-Soviet non-aggression pact as an alliance nah. in the way you think of with the Axis and allies. The treaty was much more in the vein of you don't get in our way, we won't get in your way, let's trade some stuff. And it was... And there's an uh, interesting American historian that I always mention because he is so good at researching and writing about Stalin and Russia. The non-aggression pact, as the name states, it's just a non-aggression pact. And if you see the uh, uh, invasion of Poland uh, in 1939, um, the German and the, uh, and the Soviet troops were actually fighting inside of Poland when the Germans started to move 
more and more to the east into the territory that the Russians should have occupied. Stalin just said, go, move, we're going to take it. And the Germans were like, no, 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 we, we're, we're going to help you. The Poles are running. Uh, the Polish people are running. We, we need to eliminate them and so on. And then Stalin sent in the troops and they even uh, 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 were shooting at Germans and the Germans would shoot back and so on. So it wasn't an alliance. It was a non-aggression pact where they divided Europe and the influence spheres in Europe. Like, we are going to take this part and you're going to take that part. Let's just not attack. And there's also Stalin's famous book. Uh, I think it's called Communism in One State or Revolution in One State where he, his idea was that uh, a big catastrophe, like a world war, is the only way to bring uh, revolution. So his main goal was actually, because he saw Germany and all the other countries as capitalist countries, and he was pushing for a war between Germany and the Western powers, because he thought... If they fight each other and the people get desperate because of the war times and reparations and whatever, that communists could seize power in those lands. And the same thing was with Chamberlain, who cannot be repatriated in history at all, like because he is so willified, um, or his intentions aren't pointed out why he did some things that he did. Uh, but Chamberlain's idea was, let's please Hitler and let's make it that, uh, let, let's please Hitler so that war doesn't ha happen in Europe. Why? Because they knew that Germany and the Soviet Union would get into a conflict. And then the Soviet Union would invade, so counterattack, and take all like uh, the, the, the liberated territories under their regime, under their rule. So one of his main points was, yeah, if we start a war, okay, we're probably going to win. But how are we going to root out communism from Central Europe? Because he knew like the Russians would as they eventually did way uh, until Germany and Hungary, like, and you saw it, like, communism was there for, what, 50 years, 40, 50 years after that. So he had a point, point there. His main, Chamberlain's main concern was, if Germany and Russia go into war, communism would, would be in Central Europe. But that's just a side note. <laughs> The treaty was much more in the vein of, you don't get in our way, we won't get in yeah. your way, let's trade some stuff. And it was very uneasy at many points before and during its existence, becoming most volatile during combat between German and Soviet soldiers during the Poland campaign, after the Germans yeah. overran the territory that was designated as theirs and moved into territory promised to the Soviets that actually contained oil fields, making yeah. it not very oil. subtle what the Germans were trying to do. Both Stalin and Hitler knew that some form of war was coming, just not when and who would start it, but going out of their way for the most part to not provoke it. And they didn't trust each other whatsoever. Now, I'm not implying any kind of Savorov preventative war type thing. The Soviet Union was refitting and probably wouldn't be ready for a large war until at least mid-1942. But with these two ideologically opposing powers taking territory so quickly right next to each other, it was something that was bound to happen as soon as one of them felt they were in yep. a position to make the first move. By 1941, the Germans felt they were and they took the opportunity. For more on this, and the German-Soviet mm. clashings in Poland, I'll point you towards Stephen Kotkin's second book in his Stalin series. That's the historian. Watch some of his lectures or read a book from him. He's really a good speaker. And one hour goes just like that. And he goes really into details and explains everything that he found, where he found it, in which archives and so on. So I encourage you, I'm going to put a link somewhere, probably. Go and watch one of his videos or one of his lectures. He's amazing. 
or this video of him talking about it. The declaration of war on the US is a bit more tricky, especially given that Hitler was aware of the industrial capacity of the nation. Yeah, However, he, he saw the US the as very internally focused and figured that it would take them much longer to mobilize than it did. Hitler always planned for war with the United States, yep. as outlined in his second book, written but not published, in 1928, but wanted to put it off until he was ready, often skipping on details about how it would be done. He began to assume that, due to some anti-German sentiments from Roosevelt, the Americans would declare war in 1942 coming to the aid of the Allies like they did in World War I. Piggybacking off the previous statements about the Soviets, he figured he could end the war in the East and turn and fight the West. This feeling ended, though, as the Soviet campaign continued to drag on and 1942 loomed. The German Navy had been asking for war with the United States for some time, yep. as Hitler had been holding them back to not provoke them, knowing that going against the U.S. Navy, the Kriegsmarine would come up lacking. Hitler's solution to this was Japan, which had a large navy that he thought could tie up the Americans until he was done in Russia, then turn westward and save his plan. He constantly reassured the Japanese that Germany would throw in with them if they expanded their territory south into U.S.-held islands. This was among many attempts to get Germany and Japan to fight the same enemy, which also included trying to get Japan to invade the Soviet Union from the didn't. east in June. Although Japan kept Hitler in the dark as to when they were going to attack, Hitler was very pleased when they did and immediately lifted all restrictions on his navy to attack U.S. ships, and later declared war a few days later after his foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, said, A great power does not allow itself to be declared war upon. It declares war on others. Now, this decision may have been flawed with the hindsight of putting too much no. faith in the Japanese Navy and underestimating the U.S.'s ability to fight on two fronts and mobilize so quickly, but knowing that Hitler did plan to fight the U.S. way back in the 20s, the timing may be bad, given what we know now, but it was not something that he was just not going to do, in the same way he was not going to just opt out of invading the Soviet Union. Okay, so to the previous point, uh, or to that point, I made already a few comments, but I also agree with him. Like the arch enemy of national socialism was uh, communism and socialism or whatever you want to call it in Russia and also inside of Germany. And as he said, and he, as he pointed out, uh, it was also seen as a Jew thing. So ideologically, the Germans would... It, it was just a matter of time when they are going to attack the Soviet Union. And of course, because of the oil. Uh, regarding the US, yeah, he also wanted to declare war way, way before the Second World War started. And he mentions it all also. But it was more of a... Also a question of when. When do we declare war? Because we don't want to fight on two fronts. We already have the experience from the First World War. Uh, and as I said in the last video, the Germans uh, have less manpower than the Allies combined, so they need to trade efficiently. And I, I, I mean, the points that he's making are logical. So the Germans would, would invade and declare war on both of them eventually. Only if you, as he said, if you change the whole ideology of the Nazi party and if you change the whole, uh, if you would say, I don't know, Hitler, if Hitler wasn't even born, like it goes into absurds, but yeah. So invade Great Britain, no. The US Navy, uh, the US, the British Royal Navy was way, way stronger than the the German, and the uh, they traded uh, very efficiently above La Manche, like in the uh, with their Royal Air Force, with the famously known um, Spitfire. So they gave the Germans a pretty hard time, and eventually the Germans the Germans had also a a lot of plans to invade Great Britain, but eventually the Germans themselves. Uh, came to the conclusion, no, we couldn't trade efficiently in a invasion of Britain because we don't have the manpower and the technology and everything. But I this is the I one that I see the most. The Take the British out before you turn east, as if it was that simple. 
The Germans tried no. this. First by attempting to bomb the British into submission, which didn't work, and second by planning the invasion of the British home island in an operation named Sea Lion. This was going to be the Zero. amphibious assault that would take Britain out of the war, and plans were drawn up and early preparations were yep. made. But before going through with it, the Germans themselves realized this wasn't going to work and cancelled it. The short answer for why is the Royal Navy and the inability of the Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe to control the channel. The German Navy would be unable to keep the channel clear of British warships to enable troops and supplies to reach the British coast unless the army's landing was i just wanted to point out um regarding the bombing of 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 um of the mainland i mean of the of great britain yeah the bombing had actually a counter effect and that was that the uh, civilian population was actually more anti-german and more willing to fight the germans because of that and you know the famous speech of churchill uh, like, we will fight on the landing grounds, we will fight on the beaches, we will fight in the streets, in the hills, and so on. I'm sorry for the small cut, I continued to talk for like another 5 minutes, but the memory card on the GoPro was full. So I needed to download the video and <laughs> then uh, reset the, the memory card. But just to finish my point, yeah, the Brits were more motivated to uh, to fight the Germans... Uh, also if they invade on the mainland and that famous speech from Churchill where he said we will fight them on the streets on the hills and so on that was actually the common sentiment sentiment um, around the civilian population so okay a very narrow front resulting in less water needing to be covered knowing the coast was going to be heavily defended the army rejected this plan as they would need a wide landing front so they were not just feeding men into a meat grinder in short the germans did not have the material to carry out a successful landing without it either bogging down and being cut off on the ground or being simply sunk on the way to its destination in the 70s the royal military academy sandhurst war game the scenario with conditions favorable to the germans and came up with the operation being a total failure some commenters have gone as far really? as to suggest using paratroopers to take the British down. If a, if a, if a simulation says you cannot do it, then you can. Commenters have gone as far as to suggest using paratroopers to take the British down, but I think you need to only look as far as Crete and Arnhem to see how badly an unsupported airborne operation can go. The Germans would still have to land by sea to resupply them and get relief troops on the yep. ground, and the Royal Navy was too large an obstacle to allow this to happen, even by the Germans' own admission. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know that. Uh, well, I mean, if the Germans themselves said that the invasion is impossible, then why even argue for that point? One particular comment out of all of them really stood out to me. It began with, if the Nazis weren't Nazis, they would have won. And I think this really speaks to the core of my point. Alternative history is fun. It makes for good Hoi 4 games, but when really talking about it seriously, it's really hard to come by any academic conclusions outside of a few days of speculation. Because you begin building assumption on assumption on assumption, and before you know it, you have changed the motivations and decision-making patterns of everybody you're talking about. And you are then just writing fan fiction. This is your brain. This is your brain on alternative history. Would Germany have won <laughs> World War II if the Nazis weren't in power? Maybe. But it's also equally likely they wouldn't have started the war, or joined the Allies, yeah. or anything else. If there's no basis in reality to do with the people you are talking about in your assumption, what's the point? Germany decided to start a war that within a little over two years would see them taking on three superpowers at once, with the resources of most of the world behind them. Add in strategic mistakes and intelligence failures, it paints a very grim picture from the start, regardless of decisions made after the fact. Speaking of intelligence failures, don't let your private information go the way of- Yeah, and the thing is also, uh, yeah, as he said, people- when they talk about alternative history, it's always fu fu fun to ask what if, what if, but, and so on. But we look from a today's point of view, but you don't know what people were, were thinking back then, like let's say a general, which information he had on enemy troops, on his own troops, or, or I don't know, whatever. You always need to try to put yourself in the mind of the person that you're researching you need to put yourself into the time that that particular topic uh, was made the so-called zeitgeist so yeah it's it's fun 
to, to think about it. But um, as he said, like people would stretch it up and they would always continue with, with the same pattern with what if, but, and so on. And sometimes if you continue on that road, you just lose uh, the real picture from which you started to, to, to form your assumptions. And then, as he said, like, what if Nazis didn't rule over Germ Germany? Or as I said in the last video, uh, what if Hitler wasn't in power, but some other dude? And yeah. <laughs> mein Führer, your Minecraft account has been compromised. If the German armies, there are plenty of Alan Turing's out there looking for information and private data that do not have the same honor and duty to country that the original did. If you're like me, you probably forget and end up reusing your password for the sake of convenience. But when you do that, it's like using the same code books over and over. And if one password is cracked, all your accounts could be, including banking info. Alan Turing and, and, the, and the famous Enigma machine. Yeah, the rest is uh, uh, um, advertising for, for the sponsor. Okay, so yeah, I I agree with all his points and I think that he gives a lot of data on why he thinks that those uh, presumptions are wrong. And as I said, I actually agree with him. Okay, so I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, once again, the happy Victory in Europe Day, whoever is celebrating today or celebrated yesterday. And uh, if you like this video, uh, please hit the subscribe button once again and the ring bell. And uh, you can also support the channel via Patreon. Okay. Um, well, yeah. See ya.